Let's talk about the transfer function fitting method, which is really a powerful system identification method that we very often use in experimental dynamics. And the idea is to take any kind of frequency response function and to fit it with a transfer function model that is optimal. So uh, we're going to start off with uh, a frequency response function HYX of F. And uh, this is a dynamical system where the input is described by uh, x of t and the output is described by y of t. Now these are time domain signals and what I can do is I can take uh, x of t and y of t and I can convert them via Fourier transform to frequency domain and then I can use the h1 method and the h2 methods to obtain the FRF. So here I have the Fourier transform of x that is multiplied by the Fourier transform of y and I'm going to do the same thing in the denominator. Um, this was something we talked about in lecture 3 and here we're just uh, writing down the uh, cross spectral density and the auto spectral densities and we're going to do the same thing for the H2 method. Ideally if noises are small in your system in the inputs and the outputs of your system you should expect these two methods to give you fairly similar results, if not identical. So we're going to complete this. And here we are. Now, assuming I have a single degree of freedom system shown here by the spring, the dash pod and the mass M, I'm going to have a base and uh, the motion of the mass is described by y. This is my output. The input into the system is x. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to describe the experimentally obtained frequency response function. And uh, of course, with experiments, you're going to have noise. So we're going to see all these r little ripples. And uh, this is the phase diagram. So we have amplitude, phase, and frequency. And really what we want to do is to fit this frequency domain data with a transfer function uh, that pretty much describes this dynamical process. So this is our TF model. X of T is the input and Y of T is the output. And so the idea is to create an approximate transfer function and uh, it's going to look like this. It's going to be called G of S. The output of this approximate transfer function is going to be called H of T. So we're going to call this the estimated output. And uh, what we want to do is to improve this transfer function iteratively until the estimated output matches, of course, to a certain extent with the actual output. And to do this, we have to solve a minimization problem, which we're going to formulate as follows. Uh, we're doing, uh, we're trying to minimize the difference between the estimate and the actual output. And this kind of uh, minimization turns out to be a nonlinear least square problem, which is fairly difficult to solve. But there are a number of ways to tackle this problem, and these are fairly established methods. So um, let's write down methods. And uh, good examples of these methods include the Gauss Newtonian method. So here it is. Uh, there is also the Stiglitz McBride method. And uh, the third most common method is called the uh, Lavenberg Marquardt. Lavenberg Marquardt. Here it is. OK, now let's formulate an experiment uh, with a two-story building. Here we have uh, mass M1, mass M2. Motion of mass 1 is described by Y1 and mass 2 described by Y2. These are the degrees of freedom. And the input into the system is described by X double dot, which is the ground acceleration. Now, what I can do is I can introduce uh, an input acceleration or X double dot that is something called a white noise. <clears throat> and white noise is, you can almost think of it as a random vibration 
that has equal energy at all frequencies. So if I were to do a power spectral density plot, you would see that at all the uh, frequencies, I have roughly equal energy levels. So if I were looking at frequency F1 uh, versus frequency F2, I would roughly have the same energy level. So we call this uh, white noise. And white noise is uh, very uh, interesting because uh, it excites all frequency bandwidths and it's very good for uh, experimental verifications and system identification methods. Now, I'm going to use uh, three accelerometers, one at the base to measure ground acceleration, one for Y1, and one for Y2. And I'm going to measure accelerations at each of the floors. So the first one's going to be my input. The last two are going to be my outputs. So we have ourselves a steel frame structure here on board a uniaxial shake table device. You can kind of think of this shake table as being the ground and how ground introduces accelerations into our building structures. I also have accelerometers that are installed at the base, first floor, and the second floor. So I can pretty much measure what the input acceleration is that the ground is introducing to my building at the base, and I'm measuring the output accelerations at each of the floors. And now I'm going to use that kind of information to model this building and see how I can uh, identify damage in my structure. So we have three capacitive accelerometers, one at each floor, and uh, I also cut up some balsa wood and used it as stiffeners to increase the stiffness of my building. And really the idea is to increase the stiffness and the resulting natural frequency of my building, and I'll show you what happens to their frequency response function now. Alright, so now we have the time histories that we recorded from the experiments that were just demonstrated. Uh, on the left we have the results uh, with the braces, and on the right we have the results without the braces. And you can see the base acceleration, first floor, and second floor accelerations. But really, you can't tell much from the uh, time history results. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to package these um, time history results uh, with inputs and outputs in every packages and uh, we are dealing with the case uh, with the brace for the first and the second floor and no brace for the first and the second floor and uh, we're converting these results into frequency domain uh, i'm showing the cross power spectral densities uh, so here we're doing uh, the auto and uh, cross spectral density functions and we are getting the magnitudes and the phases of the frequency response function which I'm going to use uh, later on uh, to do plots. So we're doing the same thing for the second floor, uh, for the case with no braces, uh, first floor, and the second floor. So four in total. And uh, these are the plots that I'm doing. And at any point, you can pause the video and look at my code. And so what you can see is the different uh, frequency response functions. Uh, uh, there's one in red and one in blue. Uh, the case in red is uh, for the building structure without the added braces, so you have less stiffness and your natural frequencies are to the left, your building is softer. Uh, for the case where you have the added braces, you are looking at the blue structure. Uh, so uh, this is the first frequency response function, and the second frequency response function is H double dot 2, Y2, X double dot of F. And... Uh, uh, again, this is uh, with brace, and the red is without the brace. And what you can also notice is that the uh, peaks are changing, so you could identify how the braces change your natural frequency. And also, uh, because of the noise we have, the phases are a little obscure, but uh, this is roughly what we're seeing. And uh, for the second floor, th this is what it's going to look like. There's a 180 degree shift, and here it goes. 
and you can also see the changes in the peaks over there. Now I'm going to use the MATLAB transfer function fitting command TF estimate. Uh, I'll give my inputs and outputs. Uh, I'll tell the command uh, that I want to use eight poles for my transfer function. You can increase the number of poles you uh, have for more accuracy, but your system will just be more complicated. Um, so the first system, which is from base acceleration to first floor acceleration, is going to look like this. This is the transfer function we're dealing with. And so we have eight poles. And then uh, you can see that the fitness of the data is set to 83.27%. It's not very good, but it's, it's okay. It's something I can live with. And for the second system, uh, which is for the base acceleration to the second floor acceleration, I'm seeing 93.62%. And you can ignore the negative. Don't mind the negative. And so uh, what I'm showing here now is the uh, results of my system identification for the case with the brace. And in the blue, what you're seeing is the actual experimental outputs from the accelerometers. So I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna mark those by the frequency response functions that we had earlier because those are experimental results. And I also have the uh, system identification results, which I'm gonna draw in red. And uh, we're going to call them g, y, double dot, one, x double dot of s. So that's a transfer function that we system identified. And uh, now I can do uh, all sorts of things with this uh, result. And you can see that the results are matching uh, in red and in the blue. So my results are good. Okay, thanks for joining us and see you next time.